so I'm Felicity Scott, uh, along with Marcus Suter, um, uh, co-director of the, uh, the CCCP program here at GSAP. Uh, and it's really a great pleasure to be able to welcome Keller Easterling uh, tonight to give this year's CCCP lecture uh, under the title Medium Design. So we're very excited that Keller accepted our invitation. Uh, she's been both a great inspiration for and a friend of the CCCP program since it began, I think, nine years ago, as a, a sort of initiative to forge a, a cross-platform experimental institutional space for thinking about architecture uh, and architectural pedagogy through an expanded range of research and dissemination practices from critical and creative writing uh, to curating and making exhibitions to other forms uh, of visual and conceptual interventions. Indeed, um, her work has served as an important and much-cited model of how to think about and how to sort of do architecture otherwise, how to complicate its critical tools, its conceptual frameworks, its geography, uh, and its materialities. Uh, and through all of these, how to, let's say, sort of understand and speak about um, what architecture is, where it is, what it might do, or what we might do to it, we could say, uh, and how we can identify its uh, modes of, of uh, sort of operating and some of its effects. So her readings of architecture as a technique of political organization, as a set of logistical protocols and infrastructures uh, bearing political dispositions, as spatial products that are imbricated within global political machinations and geopolitical machinations, uh, all of these, among with many other um, uh, ways of thinking about the discipline, have um, uh, very much impacted or left a, a profound mark on our thinking about the discipline. As, I should say, have the, the formats through which Keller has worked or through which her work uh, really enters the, the so-called public sphere, in addition to uh, print media books and articles uh, and lectures. She's worked extensively with digital media, uh, including a, a laser disc publication as early as 1992, and I uh, should say that she was really an uh, important protagonist uh, in the discipline's experimentation of the so-called digital turn um, at that moment. Moreover, she has around 20 exhibitions to her credit, along with a series of television broadcasts and web-based works, uh, and even theatrical plays. Uh, she, moreover, has helped us all, I think, to see architecture not only through the lens of, of objects or the figure and a so-called figure-ground relationship, but through tracing fields of information, of actors, you know, networks, and sites, from which we find something still recognizable uh, as architecture, emerging into visibility, you know, quite literally as, as elements or sort of complex of elements that, um, yeah, within unstable and highly politicized force fields. Yeah, and fields, these fields, I presume this is part of what you're going to talk about today, fields that are not sort of grounds or backgrounds in a conventional sense, um, but really are the sort of material uh, of her research. So that Keller's work has been a central referent uh, for CCCP as a program is evident not only through repeated citations of that work and other evident traces that it has left, but in the remarkable fact that without um, Mark and I prompting uh, the students, um, the CCCP students invited her uh, to speak in almost every symposium they've organized. <laughs> uh, and she's proven time and again to be uh, an important and very generous uh, but critical voice in CCCP thesis reviews for which we're very, very grateful. Uh, so a few professional details before I hand the podium over to Keller. Uh, Keller is currently Professor of Architecture at the Yale School of Architecture, uh, where she's taught since 1998. She's also Principal of Keller Easterling Architects here in New York. She's the author of seven books uh, and the co-editor of three more books, and among her uh, um, sole authored monographs are Extra Statecraft, The Power of Infrastructure Space, uh, and a book called Subtraction, both of 2014. Um, Enduring Innocence, Global Architecture and Its Political Masquerades of 2005, and Organization Space, Landscapes, Highways, and Houses in America of 1999. Uh, and among her exhibition practice, I just wanted to note that uh, this year, she is an exhibitor in the American Pavilion of the Venice Architecture Biennale. And four years ago, she presented a floor or the floor section within the Central Pavilion Elements Exhibition um, at the Biennale um, directed by Rem Koolhaas and OMA. Her work is also featured in the 2016 Istanbul Di uh, Design Biennial. And her remarkable exhibition called Some True Stories uh, traveled from its initial showing here in New York at Storefront for Art and Architecture to the University of Michigan. 
She's been awarded far too many honours and awards to be named here, all in line, I think, with her remarkable and wide-ranging contribution. And they're not just awards in, uh, in architecture, uh, they range across many fields. Uh, so in sum, uh, Keller is not only an important and challenging voice in and, and for architecture, for whom, uh, from whom we've all learned uh, so much, but she's a paradigm of what we value in the CCCP program, uh, and we're extremely pleased uh, to have her speaking here for us tonight. Uh, so Mark and I are going to uh, join Kala after her talk. Um, I know we've been listed as respondents. I, I, since we don't yet know what we're going to hear, I don't know that it will be a response in a uh, conventional sense, um, but we'll be uh, opening up a conversation uh, around her presentation. Um, so please join me in welcoming Kala Riesterling. Thank you so much. Uh, Many thanks to Felicity and Mark. It's a, it's a privilege to be invited by the CCCP program, you know, a, a program whose reputation is growing and redoubling. I'm a great admirer of your work. Um, uh, so um, my, I'm showing you a bit of Mohammed bin Salman's new uh, porn, and there'll be a bit more urban porn sprinkled throughout, you'll see, but my, I suppose you might call um, my work something like medium design. If, for those of you who don't know anything about my work, I always say that I'm often looking with half-closed eyes at the urban world, focusing not only on buildings with shapes and outlines, but also on a matrix of rules and relationships in which those buildings are suspended, um, an almost infrastructural matrix, but, but not an infrastructure like pipes and wires under the ground, um, but a matrix that's made up of repeatable formulas and spatial products, you know them, skyscrapers, malls, golf courses, resorts, franchises, parking lots, airports, ports, free zones. And these, uh, uh, almost infrastructural rules and relationships are far from hidden um, an all too visible enveloping medium, maybe something like a spatial technology or uh, something like multiple spatial operating systems for the city. And this technological matrix is arresting not only because of its wild mixtures of violence and candy colored fairy tales, because it's a secret weapon of stealthy political power, because it's creating de facto forms of polity that are outpacing law, and because it's rapidly 3D printing a new layer of the Earth's crust. But this medium thinking or medium design is a, a habit of mind that's ever present and practiced in many disciplines. Oncologists analyze not only the tumor but chemical fluctuations in the surrounding tissue, Actors transmit information not only in their lines, but in a string of interdependent actions that are unfolding in time. Geologists don't merely taxonomize specimens, they read them as traces of a, of a process. But still, this medium thinking is maybe under-rehearsed in, in the face of more dominant cultural habits. In some kind of fatal error, the beautiful, soft, watery human organism accidentally assumes a habit of mind that loves being right. Culture is, is good at pointing to things and calling their name, but not so good at describing the relationships between things or the repertoires they enact. It, it privileges declarations, right answers, universals, telos, elementary particles. It's captivated by circular logics, um, uh, 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 by, by modernist scripts that celebrate freedom and transcendent newness, narrative arcs that are you know, bending towards the utopian or the dystopian ultimate. And this collective mind that, that looks for the one or the one and only is so often then organized like a closed loop and, and since the loop that only circulates compatible information can't abide contradiction, it, it, it lashes out with a binary when, when it is challenged. These are the communist bunny rabbit cartoons. Um, 
but so favoring successive rather than coexistent thoughts or practices. The new right answer must kill the old right answer. Your freedom has to rob another of, of their freedom. Then the fight should build to a revolution or an apocalyptic burnout. Cue the brooding music. The oscillating between loops and binaries, an unnecessarily violent creature having eliminated the very information it needs is then often banging away with the same blunt tools that are completely inadequate to address perennial problems and, and contemporary chemistries of power. So a bully is elected, a migration of refugees swells in number, a financial crisis makes properties worth less than nothing, an industrial disaster kills thousands, shorelines flood due to global warming, and, and if economic and military templates of causation provide no explanation, if new technologies don't provide the solution, if, if the consensus surrounding laws and standards and master plans provide no relief, little sense can be made of the problem. Uh, assuming that these problems are simply impossibly deadlocked or unresponsive to rational thought, even the smartest people seem to stand with hand to brow. These are the sort of hackneyed plot lines of our humanities. The binaries of war and the chest beating Westphalian sovereignty of nation remain in place as the darlings of history. Homo economicus is allowed to upstage and hold forth. Sci fi's assume the structure of ancient tragedies. Dark conspiracies foil our hero. Smart is confused with new. Empowered is confused with free. And dissent also adopting a binary, exists in a world of enemies and innocents. And since the world's big bullies and, and bulletproof forms of power thrive on this oscillation between loop and binary, it's as if there's nothing to counter them. What do we have uh, the, against these things like the orange one? Uh, only more ways of fighting and being right and providing the rancor that nourishes their violence. So how do you drop through a trap door and engage the flip side of these logics? On that flip side, where then nothing is new, uh, nothing is right, there are no dramatic manifestos, but, but maybe there's a chance to rehearse a habit of mind that's been eclipsed. And it would then be something you already know how to do you're already able to detect with those half-closed eyes a world at a different focal length. So rather than only declarations and right answers and objects and determinations, you can detect and manipulate the medium or the matrix. And, and just as this medium thinking inverts the typical focus on object over, over field, maybe the, the medium design can invert some habitual responses to the mechanics and aesthetics and politics of, of stubborn problems. M many people here are, are architects and urbanists, but speaking to any discipline or treating anyone like a designer, medium design might use space to prompt some productive thought about both spatial and non-spatial problems, like, like those like those media theorists, contemporary media theorists who are not bound by communication technologies and who are returning to elemental understandings of media as, as surrounding environments of air and water and earth. Maybe this medium design can treat the lumpy, heavy material of space itself as an information system and, and a broad, inclusive mixing chamber for many social political and technical networks. And sp so space then doesn't need the screens and sensors of the Internet of Things to make its stiff arrangements dance. They're already dancing. And, and even at a moment of digital ubiquity and innovation, um, space then might be an underexploited medium of innovation with the capacity to make other information systems dumber or smarter. And, and maybe these, these large socio-technical organizations that I've been showing you before, the repeatable formulas for formatting space all over the world, maybe they're even a good thing to think with because they are everywhere and nowhere. From the micro to the macro scale, from institutions and cities, they are too large 
or, or too widely distributed to be assessed as a discrete object with a name or shape or outline. They don't respond to singular solutions or determinations, and they can really only be assessed by the activity or disposition imminent in their organization as it unfolds over time and territory. But in any context, large or small, designing the medium is managing the potentials or relationships between objects, the activity or disposition that's imminent in their organization. The disposition of any organization makes some things possible and some things impossible. Like a growth medium, it decides what will live or die. Like an operating system, it sets the rules of the game. The, the things that link and activate the components of an organization. And on this flip side where stock narratives about new technologies and sci-fi futurologies and lubricated freedoms don't make sense, there would be little authority given to declarations and master plans and standards and laws. Instead, you might focus on some extra, maybe probably unanticipated political and aesthetic capacities found in indeterminacy, in discrepancy, in temperament, and in latency in organizations. Indeterminacy. So, so since, since, since unreasonable politics easily unravels reasonable politics, being right is a, is a really bad idea in medium design. It's, it's too weak. It, it doesn't work against gurus and totalitarian bullies. And maybe culture's spectacular failures, together with some underexploited powers of medium design, inspire another way to register the design imagination, sort of form making in another key or another part of speech. Designers are very good at, at making things with shapes and outlines, but medium design is really less like making a thing and more like having your hands on the faders and toggles of, of organization. It's the design of interdependencies and chemistries and chain reactions uh, or something like ratchets. It benefits from uh, an artistic curiosity about spatial wiring or reagents in spatial mixtures, a curiosity about designing not only a single object, but a platform for inflecting populations of objects or setting up potentials within them. And there's an artistic comfort with dynamic markers and, and unfinished processes. So the, the dispositions of space are manipulated then not with right answers and solutions and master plans, but, but with time-released active forms, multipliers, switches, or other um, you know, what you could call organs of interplay with some extended temporal dimensions that allow them to unfold and remain in play. So, so medium design would then be something like playing pool, where knowing about one fixed sequence of shots is of little use, but, but being able to see a branching network of possibilities allows you to add more information to the table. So in pool, you know, you don't, you don't know the right answer. You only know how, uh, uh, know, know how to play pool. You only know something about what to do next. You know how to respond to a string of changing conditions over time with uh, something like an organ of interplay. And, and maybe you will gasp at, at what is to come next, but, um, but medium design is then, is then indeterminate, not to be mysterious or unknowable or equivocal, but to be practical. So the, I, you know, me, I would say this habit of mind is, is pretty bored with the safety of the purely rhetorical. I mean, there is the sort of nose-breathing art of reportage about pool, but then there's the art of playing it, um, which, which far from vague, involves a number of explicit precision moves that are just sequenced with some indeterminacy. So, so medium design then enters the very uncomfortable realm of performance with all its inevitable mistakes and embarrassments. And I think it's probably a subtext of this, of this talk or something that I wanted to talk to you about. Um, the, the ways in which we might 
sometimes protect ourselves from another degree of criticality that comes with that performance. So, so how do you practically design an organ of interplay? For instance, in design, you know, usually in design, you can only add more built material. But if you consider an interplay of, of spatial variables that adjusts an ecology of building, ebbs and flows, and even then even the subtraction of architecture is possible, like in floodplains or distended suburbs. And, and I, won't, I won't go into detail about this protocol because it takes a little while to unwind, but, but it imagines um, reverse engineering the mortgage that was a multiplier of sprawl and even global financial environmental disaster. So it's saying, you know, what if you introduce interplay um, by simply considering mortgages in groups that are rated for complementary or counterbalancing attributes uh, that reduce collective risk. So it works, it works it, like a ratchet, like one, one move after another. Um, and and it, all the protocols I'll show you are anything can be gamed and this interplay could be dangerous or productive, but, but the idea of interplay might have enough temporal dimension to react to changing conditions or more importantly, to respond to the moment when it's politically outmaneuvered. And, 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 and interplay is not a solution, but something that actually shouldn't always work. So designing this protocol that is, in, that is indeterminate to be practical, that would be something like medium design. But instead of a, a kind of paradoxical quest for freedom, more empowering or information rich are situations that gain strength to interplay through mutual obligation or checks and balances or offsets or bargains. And replacing the kind of parboiled master plans, what are, what are also the pop culture cinematic time lapse documents that, that show these ratcheting changes? Here's another protocol of interplay with completely different content. In, in the jungles of Kenya, or this is the rainforest of Ecuador, um, we already know that there are strong relationships between roads and erasure of forest. So while roads, typically regarded as conduits of progress and opportunity, the means to deliver broadband and other infrastructures, in rural or wilderness areas, they can also erase the information that's imminent in cities and villages and landscapes. Again, space itself as an information system. So this protocol considers uh, an interplay between broadband, roads, and forest or jungle. Uh, so it's, it's asking you, saying maybe it might be more productive to dial down roads, the gray lines, um, when dialing up broadband, this sort of red radiating circle, to, in order to preserve farms and forests, which are kind of a green information system that attracts whatever that is, you know, uh, uh, more global resources for, for, for tourism or education that happen to be also broadband hungry. So, so digital and spatial platforms can make each other more information rich or information poor. And in this case, changing a road as well as changing a bit of code can hack into a telecommunications network. And, and while in a world of, of, kind of closed loops, organizations and institutions are usually trying to eliminate any contradiction or error. It's, it's standard industrial policy. But, it, but medium design, I would say, probably works better when you're multiplying problems. So like Perando's paradox, the game theory that demonstrates that if you play a losing game with the probability of losing, uh, you will continue to lose. But if you alternate between two losing games, each with a probability of losing, you, you can begin to generate wins. It's as if the losses create a kind of ratcheting um, traction. 
against which you make small gains. So it's not homeostasis, uh, but imbalance, not fixed pools of information, but extrinsic information, contradiction, mixtures of information that provide a, a wealth of potential to disrupt that closed loop or binary. So maybe it's not the existence or the, it's not, it's not the content of the problem, but the interplay between problems that's important. Medium design, like pool, um, is also a game that's surrounded by hustlers. It, it, it has a, and it has a currency in discrepancy. So to assess and manipulate medium, it's almost as if you have to cultivate a capacity to perceive in a split screen, to straddle mental partitions that separate the nominative from the active and the dispositional. So you develop something like a canine mind, or a dog hears you saying the words in English or some language, good girl, but, and those words have assigned meanings, but a dog would never rely only on the assigned meanings of the words good and girl. They would only see things within, within a thousand affective cues, uh, those two words, good girl, how, how close you are to the door or the dog bowl, or where, whether you have a leash in your hand, or even degrees of violence. Um, would all be assessed equally with the sound of, of words and their assigned meanings. So in this split screen, kind of turning the sound down on declarations, is, is maybe easier to detect the difference between what an organization is saying and what it's doing, how organizations decouple their messages from their real activities and their underlying dispositions. So on, so on one side of the screen, you know, so many stories about socio-technical organizations, whether they're railroads or hydroelectric networks or blockchains, this is Ethereum, you know. Um, you know, it always, always the message is about decentralization and freedom. When often the real disposition of the organization may be concentrating power and authority with a, with a universal ambition. Or the smart city, you know, maintains the shine of the new, even when it centralizes information in ways that violate privacy, even if the network is in, in, in its disposition quite primitive or crude. A dumb binary of likes and dislikes filters a social media network that purports to be information rich. A global network of Dubai style free zone cities facilitates not its sort of storied uh, free trade, but manipulated trade. Uh, a centralizing power espouses a populist message. And the world's superbugs and bulletproof forms of power, they are at once kind of masters of monistic demagoguery and binary, you know, head-on brutality, but they're also masters of the split screen. And like a confidence man, they, they know how lies work. Um, and, and just like being right is a bad idea in this kind of world, telling one lie is a bad idea because uh, uh, telling many lies works really well. You know, one lie calls for reconciliation and truth. Many lies creates Teflon. And unburdened by truth, running rings around earnest declarations, the superbug knows how to make words dance and fascinate um, in the absence of meaning and information. So lies are then everywhere, animated in color, they lubricate, they insulate, and the discrepancy that others are trying to futilely reconcile um, is just the raw material of, of mediated rumor, contagious fiction um, that can batter the walls, work the back channels, stunning with stunning success. And again, it's not what lies say but how they bounce that's important, how often they're repeated. And so the superbug becomes pure medium, activity divorced from, from content. So, so while I said, you know, we're bored with the safety of the purely rhetorical, um, design that has any hope of affecting change um, manipulates the organization as well as the instrumental narrative that attends it. 
you know, with moves that are potentially sneakier and more politically agile. And it may be a dissonant story uh, that has nothing to do with the organization. It may be, you know, however non-physical has physical consequences. It, it may be a narrative that makes something contagious or that generates a Teflon surface of its own. It may have an emotional message that renders some power more vulnerable. It may have a surprising cultural bounce because of its irrationality or its outrageousness or its cuteness or its creepiness or its violence. Here's a, here's a super saturated ad about uh, automated vehicles you know, that, are, that are touted as the means to perfect driving, reduce emissions, uh, increase productivity, but we know that this kind of pure embrace of the technology uh, creates a kind of boomerang effect. So if cars, just to go through it, if cars provide the same hands-free ride that transit does, and if they're used in lieu of transit, so imagine the space of the seat in a transit car, now all the size of a car, um, they will actually create unprecedented congestion and emissions and sprawl, even with carpooling and platooning. Uh, so the very smart vehicle can be trapped in a very dumb traffic jam. And to, to, to remedy the boomerang effects related to automated vehicles, you know, then the, the habitual response is to look for the, solu for the solution in the next emergent technology, like, you know, like sort of futuristic flying cars or something like that. Um, but, but an alternative response might be to alter a relationship or to rewire the network with a spatial variable uh, in, in the spatial information system, like a physical architectural volume that acts like a switch when placed between existing transportation networks the switch, like an, like an intermodal node for upshifting or downshifting into uh, transportation of different capacities. And when we did a, a long study of this, it ended up being you know, promising as a, a model for organizing maintenance and, and innovation, even investment, e even liability in this shifting transportation ecology. So th designing that switch would be something like medium design. But, but if you really want to do it and uh, you know, reduce emissions and sprawl while increasing ridership and transit, wouldn't, wouldn't you also have to have the stomach for the spin? You know, the sort of sneaky story, uh, you know, telling in the soft focus ads that, that portrays the seduction of switching. Um, the story, you know, that would somehow pry the car from the cold, dead hands of Americans, or would we be too embarrassed for that? So to observe organizations in this canine split screen, not only the stories and lies on one side, but also the oscillation between loop and binary on the other, to do that is already to observe temperament, something like temperament in organizations as a, 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 the, the potential for concentrating or distributing power, as well as a potential for escalating or, or reducing violence. And the free zones that I study graphically model culture's violent tendency to form closed loops that only circulate compatible information and expel any incompatible or inconvenient circumstance or challenger. Uh, the other, which in this case is usually the worker. And workers are always on the receiving end of that violence in an, in an environment that's also, you know, ironically kind of saturated with best practice acronyms and bullet pointed lists and mandalas and motivational aphorisms of management ease. Uh, that, on, that only serve to inoculate power against change. It's another loop, the house always wins. Uh, continually closing the loop, squaring off in a binary against the worker. And while this global infrastructure space has perfectly streamlined the movements of, of billions of products and tens of millions of tourists and cheap laborers, 
um, at a time when 65 million people in the world are displaced uh, more than any other time in the history of the planet, there's somehow no way to move several million people away from atrocities like those in Syria or, or facilitate other movements related to climate or labor. You know, the nation state has a dumb on-off button for, for granting or denying citizenship or asylum. Again, the closed loop lashes out with a binary, this time set against the immigrant. And the extra state layers of governance like a kind of angiocracy, offers their best idea um, storage in a refugee camp, a, f a form of detention lasting, you all know now, on average, se 17 years. You know, the free zone is kind of the chief node of, of privileged movement for goods and people outside of the constraints of national law. It's like the refugee camp is its perverse carceral cousin. So in the medium, can, can you adjust stories and organizational potentials on both sides of the screen in a way that is attuned to temperament? We don't usually talk about that. Um, so in, a, in addition to declarations or confrontations, the designer might also operate like a parent of squabbling children. And when you, when you encounter them, you don't, you don't try to parse the content of their argument but you swiftly change the disposition of the context. You lower the temperature of the room, you move a chair into light, you increase the blood sugar of one child, or you introduce a pet into the arms of another. You're changing the chemistry of the room in a way that no longer induces or supports violence. And, and there are countless ways to adjust the solids and liquids of the urban world to reduce violence and tension. It's, it's maybe something a little bit like material advantage in chess, so it's after the game. It, the game is over. Um, and, and it's beyond market value, beyond the real estate game. Um, but urban morphologies and topologies and relationships embody potentials in Urbanism 101. Um, and, and they concentrate and distribute power. They have the capacity to include or include. And the urbanity that we treasure um, typically relies on breaking loops and binaries by multiplying or diversifying components, placing them in interdependent relationships. <laughs> Migrations of, of, of recent years have been especially polarizing. And migration is portrayed as a, as, a, as, a, as a crisis instead of a constant resource. Those migrating are portrayed as victims or the other in a binary opposition to, to right-wing xenophobic sentiments. And, and while there may be a kind of artistic familiarity with the portrayal of victimhood, um, what if you wanted to alter the temperament and dispositional potential of the organization by moving away from the sharp end of the conflict to work on a remote set of switches in, in larger networks? So countering the violence of the loop and the binary, can you work on the medium to multiply one-to-one -one exchanges? That, that have long sponsored some of the most successful travel. So if you could do this, then kind of speaking dispositionally and temperamentally, you might be moving from the one, um, the loop, the binary, to the one-to-one -one and the many. So this project of many um, is an online platform I'm working on that's designed to facilitate migration through an exchange of needs. So it first refuses to regard migrating people as victims, um, and it serves those who might want to resettle, but also those who want to keep traveling, you know, who never wanted the citizenship that the nation withholds or reluctantly bestows. So by saying, you know, I, I don't really you know, want your citizenship or your victimhood or your structured racism or your bad jobs, it kind of leaves the right wing to throw itself against an open door. And so instead, we want another kind of cosmopolitan mobility based on a more robust networking of short-term project-based journeys um, that can maybe be aggregated for global 
credentials. So, so is this project is asking, you know, could there be a kind of global form of, of matchmaking between the sideline talents and needs of migrating populations and a multitude of needs and opportunities around the world? Where there are no haves and have nots, as with Perando's paradox, you need, problems are good. Needs and problems are the necessary assets. And, and cities might bargain with their underexploited spaces, like the spaces you see uh, as, you know, in material advantage in chess. Um, they might bargain with those underexploited spaces to attract a changing influx of talent and resources, so matching their needs with the needs of mobile people to generate some kind of mutual benefit. Space and time, problems, maybe opportunities for training, mix, could mix in these non-market exchanges uh, where, where there's a kind of group to group exchange to increase security. So could, could some kind of cosmopolitan mobility organize around intervals of time or, or seasons of life to form a branching set of options that's more, more politically agile? The visa game is fraught, ugly, dangerous. This is not in any way a kind of sunny, one world sharing economy. Um, uh, and if medium design that I've been talking about all this time is, is arguing for mixtures of information systems that don't privilege new technologies, then, then, then the app shouldn't really be an object of design. It's really just kind of aggregator or, or, or prompt uh, for including spatial variables uh, that might also have more authority in global, global, uh, global governance. Um, but it's a, it's a heavy information system. And it's low tech, kind of like a bulletin board. There's the, the sort of graphic conceit uh, uh, is, nods to the work of uh, Jurgis Machunis or, or, or Paul Elliman's um, typographies or uh, hobo code or cuneiform. So, you know, can, can, the, can many, though, avoid the very dangers it, it critiques? Uh, can these strings of journeys be anticipated or celebrated or accredited uh, as leadership credentials? Can it develop that interplay of obligations that's more empowering than freedom? Um, so at the Venice Biennale, we'll present uh, about 100 representative examples from research that that generate more and more combinations as we will continue to develop the platform. But, you know, our, our solutionist mind, you know, tells you uh, that it doesn't work, you know, e even though it shouldn't always work. Um, and I think also, you know, the narrative of victimhood is, is hard to give up, e even in favor of, of, of persistence and resourcefulness. So I wanted to talk with you about this, uh, not only because of the discomfort it creates, but also uh, because of the wisdom of CCCP and sort of how, asking the question, you know, how do you also get it out of the gallery um, and, and into a more atomized condition? So finally, the, the punctuating events like crises and competitions and victories and defeats those are things that usually capture the attention of the most familiar cultural narratives. But in medium design, the disposition that we've been talking about, it doesn't really happen um, because it's ever present as a latent property, just like glass uh, doesn't have to break to be brittle. A dispositional quality is kind of unfolding. Um, and and, and it, it, this is the Rana Plaza collapse, as you know, but and, and if an unsafe factory collapses or burns, there's an event to mark the violence. But in, but in countless factories and industrial parks that don't happen to buckle under the weight of their own denial and violence, there is no event. There's no drawn sword. There's only the constant aggressions of, of blatant, imbalanced, imbalanced power dynamics with their drumbeat of daily effects. So medium design might enhance an ability to detect and manipulate latent potentials even in the absence of event or declaration, the kind of slow-moving, persistent violence 
uh, or, or the interplay of rich potentials for, for which there is no history. So the histories of things that don't happen and shouldn't always work, you know, might, might be structured like an epidemiology or a branching set of thresholds and points of leverage. They might be largely concerned with how to modulate violence in organizations by making them more information rich. Or they, it might be asking, you know, what are the sort of spatio-political reagents and accelerants in moments of political metastasis and remission? Like that amazing shift in temperament in Stanley Kubrick's uh, 1960s movie Spartacus. You remember the story where the, the Roman authorities, uh, they are, you know, make it look like they're doing some kind of mag magnanimous thing by announcing to a field of slaves that are all shackled to each other that they will, uh, that they will crucify the insurgent leader Spartacus but spare everyone else. And uh, Justice Kirk Douglas, who's Spartacus, is about to stand up and identify himself by saying, I am Spartacus. Tony Curtis um, stands up and says, I am Spartacus. And then all the slaves in the field stand up and say, I am Spartacus, I am Spartacus. Um, so it's kind of an instant remission, where the slaves turn the tables on their captors. Um, and in a kind of history of things that don't happen, moments like these would not be mysterious, but or anecdotal, but, but would be central. So might, might some of the world's seemingly intractable or unresponsive problems, the superbugs and losing games, might some part of it respond to medium design? I don't know. And with the ability to detect and manipulate indeterminacy and discrepancy and temperament and latency, what are the techniques for a stealthier form of activism that, you know, without being targeted as an opponent, makes organizational changes. And what are the documents of this medium design? Are they, they might be, uh, you know, might look like a cross between a novel and an actuarial table and a platform and a film and a blockchain. Uh, and you would be manipulating the gifts and pandas and rumors and meaningless distractions and other totemic fictions that are so effective in culture. So here on the flip side, right answers are mistakes, obligations are more empowering than freedom, histories follow latent aggressions as well as gunshots, messy is smarter than new, you deliberately address problems with responses that shouldn't always work, and maybe you can steal some of the powers of infrastructure space to design a kind of snaking chain of moves to worm into and generate leverage against intractable politics. And like a really good pool player, you wouldn't call your shots, but keep them guessing. And then I always say this, but you know, it would be like being too smart to be right. Thank you. First, thank you very much, Keller, um, for a fantastic um, <clears throat> um, introduction or, or let's say insight into new work and um, your current project, which I'm very much looking forward to reading as well. Um, I, I, I mean, and again, your your presentation, you know, touched on um, uh, so many different sort of registers that, that I'm not going to try, Mark can do this, a grand act of synthesis here, but, um, but I had a, a couple of sort of small questions and um, um, just, to, just to try and um, um, to get you to talk about. And the first is, uh, I'm too I'm very fascinated by um, figures of switching and, and of ambivalence and um, in fact I'm talking about somebody very indebted to uh, switching protocols uh, tomorrow, so you'll excuse me if this is sort of coming from um, uh, some of the things I'm thinking about. But, I, um, but one thing that 
that is, um, I think, quite stunning is that the switching that, that you're proposing um, in refusing the, the binary logic that, that you set up as a sort of epistemological you know, foundation that, that drives so many of these um, um, uh, uh, sort of initial protocols, sort of embedded protocols, is not, uh, it's not a switching um, that's a simple reversal yeah, yeah, it's a more complicated switching. It's like a switching that, that you know, isn't that of the on-off switch of a conventional electronic circuit, yeah, um, but something else, yeah? And so I'm, 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 so it's, I'm just wondering if we can um, get you to talk about something like the, uh, the, the, you know, how we think the sort of ethical political logic of, a, of that switching, which is more, I'm thinking, of course, of, you know, Foucault's long-standing reading of, of, um, uh, of the you know, potential of the reversal of power in you know, any, um, uh, any, any system. And, and, but he would use a language like reversal, which is not identical to a language like switching as you present it. So I wanted to see if you had thoughts on um, what type of switch this is or, or how we think that switch. Um, and the second um, question is a really sort of, um, uh, I guess it's, very basic question, but and maybe I won't try and complicate it. But it's around the the um, incredible um, um, sort of fascinating um, relationship. Uh, I, I know you have better words for these, and I don't know. Maybe I can find them. Um, but between the um, so I'm just looking. Uh, I'm not going to get it right here. But between the the say so all of the incredibly rich and at times disturbing visual material and the um, uh, and the way that resolves into the graphic design of your interface, yeah, for the phone, yeah, for the phone, for the app, um, yeah. And so I'm thinking because you know there's many moments of design. One is the, the sort of the design that intervenes with the dispositional aspect, but there's also an interface design and that 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 is sort of haunted by a type of populism. And, yeah, yeah. So I'm wondering if I know I know that's not where the design lies, but the design necessarily has to sort of materialize into 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 those graphics, yeah. And so I'm wondering um, how you think that that relationship, yeah, but between the the um, all you know the the difficulties of of looking sometimes at the hyperpopulism of the yeah, and and the, and the way it gets translated into a um, yeah set of sort of icons and things like that. Yeah. So just yeah, does that makes sense. So two. Uh, well, I don't know what to say. Yeah. I uh, the um, I don't know. Or maybe I maybe I instead of uh, try, instead of answering a question, I yeah. will ask a question. Oh, no. um, <laughs> because uh, yeah. because I'm curious, um, you know, when that kind of material is presented, does it does it appear to be? Uh, it, sort of a, a purely theoretical uh, mm, mm, mm. Uh, presentation, or can or can you see uh, the kind of, and that's why I was talking about embarrassment, or, or can you mm. see the kind of fool, potentially foolhardy mm -hmm. uh, sense that there that there are, that some of these techniques have have or, or ways of thinking, however obvious or el mm, elementary mm. they are. Mm offer some practical responses to stubborn problems. Uh, so, you know, when the switch that I'm talking about is, and again, you may think me foolhardy, is, is, a, is, a, is a real project mm -hmm. um, uh, that is based on tons of research about automated vehicles mm -hmm. and about mm -hmm. investment in uh, about uh, an unbelievably dry set of Things that are, um, you know, look, and, and I've long been looking at the potentials for switching, mm, mm, mm. you know, from from looking at you know, the history of the highway and the history of uh, uh, the um, interchange and the ways in which that mm -hmm, was a kind mm -hmm, of dumb mm -hmm. switch when it could have been a smart, mm -hmm, smarter mm -hmm. switch, yeah. um, and you know, so the the kind of switch that I was presenting there um, is. Is one that's looking at a long history of mm -hmm. cross purposes uh, and false logics in transportation, mm -hmm. um, and looking at us just right when the Trump era is about to introduce a kind of Eisenhower uh, 
a, a Eisenhower era set mm -hmm. of highway improvements uh, just at the same time that automated technology is coming. Mm -hmm. It looks like we're you know, ready for another like perfect, perfectly stupid set mm -hmm. of moves. Um, so th this is, uh, I mean, that, that project is quite real as a suggestion for how to organize innovation and investment and, uh, mm -hmm. for, uh, for a new technology change. Yeah. Um, no, I wasn't trying to th suggest a theoretical, I was just drawing on sort of oh, theoretical no, tool. No, 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 it's an interesting question because, um, um, uh, because I, I, let's say something like the, Evidence you draw from, yeah. I mean, uh, absolutely, the the ways in which it's sort of imminent from a you know current you know media, you know technical political system, I think is is incredibly clear. So so I don't think that, uh, and I and I think, I mean, the, the, there's a the, the foolhardiness. Um, you know, I would recast as something like a sort of knowing risk taking, in which the way in which you um, uh, draw from that material and identify its potential vulnerabilities and how one might operate through those vulnerabilities to make things do other things is, um, uh, is, is not something, again, that resolves into something like an answer or a solution or something clear. And so, so I don't think it's, I mean, foolhardy. I think it's, um, let's say, risky in a way that one needs to take risks, yeah? So does that make sense? So, yeah. so I think that's the yeah. disposition, let's say, of the, your voice, yeah, as um, as a way of intervening in these unstable systems. So, yeah. But what I was trying to confess to you all, almost <laughs> so like bring you all a problem, mm. uh, was that 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 you know, wh what is it like then to also engage in in the pop culture soft focus ad mm -hmm. that changes tastes about what constitutes switching. Mm -hmm, you know? mm -hmm, I mean, mm -hmm. it, it, it's, not, it's not working from within, it's not collusion, it's manipulation, mm. but I mm -hmm. still wonder if we have the stomach for it, if we would find it embarrassing mm. or low. Um. Um, but part of... Part I of don't what find you, it embarrassing, mm -hmm. but... No, I, no, no. But, um, but, but isn't part of the, I mean, the, the challenge the risk mm -hmm, and, and mm -hmm. the participation in listening to you and reading you is, is how we want to do it. There's, mm -hmm. you, we listen to this talk and I want to be a medium designer. I, <laughs> <laughs> I want latency and temperament. Um, and we try to follow mm -hmm. what that is. And, and mm -hmm. the cunning in the presentation mm -hmm. is that it never solidifies into a set of procedures, mm -hmm. even when you're mm -hmm. describing protocols. They're protocols for evasion. Um, rather than they are direct confrontation. And, and, and so there's something about how one both glimpses mm -hmm. what medium design might be, but struggles to figure out exactly mm -hmm. how it might operate. So in a, it, at, at the same time as we see a glimpse of it, we're also given, I think in a very helpful way, mm -hmm. a set of cautions. I was mm -hmm. going to call them prohibitions, but they're more cautions. Mm -hmm. Like, mm -hmm. we don't want to be solutionist <laughs> mm -hmm. because that won't work, and we don't want to avoid lying because, mm -hmm. and we want to avoid the, uh, the disposition of wanting to be right, et cetera. And, and, and so it is mm -hmm. like a complex game field. I'm not sure if that's exactly mm -hmm. the right analogy. Um, because the other analogy that it seems like, and this is what I wanted to ask you about, is that it, it, in some way it seems like an altered version of what we might have known as general systems theory, right? Mm -hmm. When we're looking at complex new integrations mm -hmm. of technologies mm -hmm. and, and complex players. But the result there was always to produce the type of stability that was identified mm -hmm. as homeostasis. Mm -hmm. Whereas you so clearly demarcate that the project is not about homeostasis. It's, mm -hmm. it's about some other mm -hmm. conclusion. And, and so that conclusion would not be the instability of the systems that you're identifying, but some other type of instability. And it seems like that's where medium mm -hmm. design gets us. It gets us into thinking and performing another type of instability, which is not the instability of the systems of representation and technologies that you're showing us. Mm -hmm. So how 
So what is that other instability? And maybe there's no way to answer that simply, but mm -hmm. it's, it's to follow these um, chains that you set out for us, for us to, to arrive at that answer. Mm -hmm. But I don't know. I don't know if that gets us anywhere. I th th think that's, uh, that's y yes, that there's not, a, I'm trying to, not talking about systems and, yes. um, uh, you know, if, if anything, like the, the pool player or the confidence man is still like a better, um, but it worries me a little bit that, that you know, in a short talk like this where, where the, the person speaking is saying it's this, but it's not that, but, and it's not that. <laughs> yeah. um, so that it's this constant hedge between, you know, like it, it, it's almost exactly like a confidence man, mm -hmm. you know? Um, but, I, but, I, but I would assure you that it, it, perhaps that is in part for fear of, of the solution -ness that is in all of us, mm -hmm. because if you gave me time, you know, the little, the little blue tiles that mm -hmm. were going mm -hmm. by, if you gave me time, I would, in the most boring detail, unwind that protocol mm -hmm. uh, and exactly mm -hmm. how it works and how, you know, the history mm -hmm. of the FHA mortgage. And, you know, and mm -hmm. the, there is, there is um, it's not, it, in fact, it, that has l probably little dreams of being a success, yeah. you know. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and even, I mean, I, I, I think it is one of those things as a kind of reverse contagion mm -hmm. of the mortgage. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's maybe even just a little bit deceptively simple, but it, it, it just to say that the mortgages that we used to group in 17,000 houses mm -hmm. for a Levittown or something like that, what if you group them according to a slightly different logic? Um, and if they used to be, um, if, they used, if you used to uh, get your underwriting approval based on a design that considered their bankability, uh, according to the FHA, um, what, what would it be, what would it be like to score them mm -hmm. to begin to aggregate a number of indices that already exist about uh, uh, proximity to transportation, uh, to slosh maps and, and um, uh, sea level rise uh, maps and so on to gather a number of indices and score them according to those things and then watch their effects of uh, start to compound because you're allowing them to do it in groups. So, um, I mean, there's uh, I, all that to say that um, that there is like a there's like a practical, you know, and we work on mm -hmm. this quite seriously. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, so. Maybe open up to questions from a very healthy looking audience. Oh, I just thought I would I would take the silence as an opportunity um, to to take you up on on the question of the the sort of compounding problem uh, notion uh, in the context of say. A, a place that has experienced a, a, a sort of endless series of failures, that it, that it might be a kind of a, a, an, an interesting um, case study or, or or situation to introduce that question of, you know, in a place where there's a continual decade after decade of people coming and offering solutions to the problem and. And every decade offers its new set of failures to kind of, um, you know, uh, go into that situation, um, uh, offering to compound the errors and 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 and, um, and offer an opportunity for experimentation and likely failure, something like that. In and I, I suppose a lot of the environments that we all look at 
well, I think of something like you know Detroit or or New Orleans or something where the you know the municipal fathers sort of throw up their hands and say, look, the financials just don't work here. Um, that's kind of the that's kind of like where you're ready to roll up your sleeves mm. because it's because then then properties stop being trafficked mortgages and end up being solids again um, in gravity. They can, you, one can work with their potentials outside of other abstractions. And so the, those, those places where there are enormous problems are uh, so incredibly rich because of their, because of the problem. A lot of the, ma the sort of matches in the many project are, are a match between problems. Um, mm. So they complement each other in their problems. Uh, yeah, um, to your question about a kind of the practical application uh, of some of your uh, theories, um, when I read your work, I couldn't help but think of kind of legal code and uh, like written law as being this very rigid form mm. that's very prescriptive, it's very, here's what you should do, here's how you should carry something out, whether it's in a really boring government office or in a police force. Um, and that there's also kind of simultaneously with these really rigid laws, this kind of unofficial component to it, let's say judicial discretion or a particular police officer deciding not to engage on something, that, that there's so much in these rigid structures that allow for decisions, sometimes can be very evil, <laughs> bad decisions when you get a bad actor, or can be this kind of negotiation where they can have a positive effect. And I guess, I, yeah, I was just wondering if that fits or if that kind of makes sense as kind of this algorithm that, that you maybe mentioned in extra statecraft. Uh. Right, well, the, um, I mean, law is one language that is given, uh, uh, one, practice that is given enormous authority in the world. Um, and I suppose I'm, I'm trying to introduce spatial variables as often variables that are missing from a lot of those calculations. I mean, even when we're looking at the automated vehicles, it's amazing that, you know, that there's a pretty obvious, like, thumping spatial variable that's missing from this very smart, you know, uh, 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 in unbelievably sophisticated techno technological plans. Um, so a part of what I am trying to do in as a teacher, you know, we're teaching at a place like Yale where it's filled with little, you know, budding McKinseyites and Deloitte consultants and CIA agents and so on is to say, sort of say that there are, are and they, on, they almost only understand kind of management ease and econometrics. You know, uh, so I'm trying to introduce spatial variables and irrationalities um, in, as something which we must know about. And, Emmeline, yeah. The microphone is coming your way. <laughs> Thanks for your talk. Um, I just wanted to ask about sort of um, the kind of tapping into non or uncommodified, like you said, after the game is over, um, like sort of other connectivities that people have that sh they share that aren't yet commodified. And I was wondering, um, if you could maybe talk about how that might be problematized as well in terms of, you know, um, then absorbing them into a kind of digital system kind of interpolates them into commodity and kind of uh, taps into a kind of another frontier for that regime as well. Or like, um, I guess I wanted to ask what the threshold of failure and say perpetuating uh, accidental further violence or other kinds of dispossession um, and where that tolerance lies. Accidental yeah. what? 
Oh, uh, like it, um, if, if failure in a system might ex exacerbate uh, violence or, um, you know, by accident kind of um, commodify social relations on the ground or something. Mm, right. Yes. Uh, um, yeah, I mean, that, that, I suppose the, the thing that, one of the things that I find sort of really uncomfortable and frightening about working on this many project is that it, you know, it, you know, it, it could facilitate the thing that it critiques. Um, but, but I, but I do think there is that there, and it's, again, it sounds so elementary that it's almost too obvious to say, but, mm. but that, that, you know, the things that we know as urbanism 101, you know, things about relationships and proximities and uh, potentials mm -hmm. in space that are that are not commodified, not always commodified, or or there is a dissonance between the way these things are commodified and the way there and these other kind of potentials or uh, like the material advantage that the object that the heavy information system has. Mm -hmm. I, th I think being able to read that is, has enormous potential. Um, uh, is it fraught with potentials for failure as well? Completely fraught. Any, any one of these things I was showing you, it, 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 it'd, take, it'd take nothing to game it um, to the worst possible uh, in, intentions. Um, but then one's also saying at least it's, at least it's not that's you know the the answer solution. You know, at least it has enough temporal dimension to rework and remaneuver. Um, you know it, it has built into it the, the capacity for reactivity uh, against against a move. Um, but it's a different kind. I mean, it was a different kind of artistic intention or pleasure. Even that's probably not for everybody. Um. <laughs> <laughs> I may have another question. I um, was very struck by the, um, uh, I wrote down at one point, everything's an information environment. Uh, in, in the sense, when you talked about the way in which the the work we situate or, or, or is in dialogue with sort of media theoretical turn that, that moves out of you know, media infrastructural systems, the things that we uh, conventionally associate with um, histories of media technologies and media systems into seeing um, a sort of broader spectrum of, of um, objects with disposition that, that can be conceived as, as a media environment. Yeah? And I, and I was trying to th think, um, um, you know, when you uh, brought in the, the two fantastic examples of the, the squabbling children, uh, yeah, and the way in, in which one could intervene in that system, and the, and the Spartacus example, and um, um, trying to, you know, think through how those um, forms of, of um, sort of redispositioning um, take place through objects, yeah? I mean, not just people or, or yeah. media systems with the capacity to switch, but you know, how we think that moment, how we think of a, um, and, and I, I understand this is where the protocols come in and the, and the, the, the reading of the uh, shifting of the um, uh, mortgage structures and um, yeah, uh, just wondering if the, yeah, how we, how, we, how we think that as an object. I don't know, do you know what I mean? I'm trying to think that relationship, like how we, yeah. Mm -hmm. and I, I, I'm, I'm hoping that, mm. that well, you know, those media theorists who are mm -hmm. you know, now contemplating this other mm -hmm. kind of elemental mm -hmm. responsibilities that have you know, a lot to do with environment mm -hmm. and other, other political like John Durham uh, Peters, content, like John Durham yeah, Peters. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, but in, and in their, in their uh, thinking is sometimes often this crisis, like we, we're, we, we weren't trained for you know, a certain mm -hmm. kind of thinking. And so uh, uh, what I was hoping was that maybe this, this contemplation would be a friend to their 
contemplation, mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. and one that would use space to model. Mm -hmm. I mean, because we are, or we as designers and so on, urbanists, we already mm -hmm. sort of, you know, we have some skills that we can offer to their conversation mm -hmm. that are, uh, and the space can model some of the things that they're talking about, some of the, um, can, and can rehearse some of the capacities mm -hmm. of thinking in, in relationship and chemistry um, and interplay. Uh, so I hope, I hope that it will be in dialogue with mm -hmm. that. Um, so a question at the back, or two questions at the back here. So. Okay, so my first question is kind of a joke, but I'm wondering how many lies are in your presentation? Uh, and then my follow-up question is just, I'd love to know a little bit more about um, your feeling about intent. Like it seems like a lot of the median design is finding a new affect for intent, but um, I'd just love to hear more about what that, any, any other words to describe that? Um. There'd have to be more than one lie. We learned that, and uh, <laughs> yeah, I the I someone over the weekend asked me, you know, if I was if I was trying to um, you know promote lying or something like that, and I you know or or you know someone will use some idea about rumor and gossip that. Uh, that I intend to be related to the most stubborn global politics, um, you know, to, to, that I intend to be directed to the superbugs, you know, mm -hmm. the, the sort of Putin, Trump, uh, and, and the non-human superbugs as well. Uh, uh, so I, mean, I fear that I am, you know, like sort of pretty earnest, you know, in, in, uh, in my intent here. Um, you know, I don't want to disappoint you, but I, I, I'm not, I am, Im, I am certainly impure, but, uh, but, the, but, but I, I feel strongly about, um, some, I'm embarrassed to tell you, you know, that I, <laughs> I, 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 and that's part of the embarrassment I was talking about, like when, when we were actually like uh, engaging and taking on some kind of, uh, performance where we're not, it's not for good or bad, but I think it is, there is an intent to make things more information rich. Daughter, mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you very much for the uh, presentation. Um, I have a kind of a, uh, uh, kind of a, technical sort of question. Um, in Extra Statecraft, uh, you make a very profound point about how the ISO 9000 family of standards, which you also um, reference in your presentation, hasn't just inflected um, and transformed and impacted corporate culture, but also the um, culture of government and governance. And you talk, for example, about the Clinton administration and its own reckoning with this family of standards. The question I have is, uh, do you feel that this, uh, this language, this logic, has also um, transformed education, uh, the production of knowledge, what we do, uh, the accrediting institutions that we have to reckon with. Um, do you find that in the context of your own work, um, ISO 9000 is in the room, so to speak? It's certainly in the, in the academy. And uh, uh, you know, there are, I mean, I, I don't know about Columbia's situation, but at Yale, you know, there are all kinds of very well-funded, uh, mysterious um, uh, offices that are there to help you with your, you know, espousing management ease, and they have kind of unclear parameters, and mm -hmm. 
and then one one is also as a faculty member, uh, you know, taking part in the rituals of management ease, the surveys, the the uh, retreats, mm. the the breakout sessions, the magic markers, <laughs> the stuffed animals. Uh, um, the little aphorisms and charts and so on, uh, all with the sort of like this constant feedback of information until there's until it all turns to nothing, you know. Um, and it is sad that that and and it, this management culture believes itself to be correcting the academic who you know is so misguided that they they don't know how to really do anything. Um, so it is sad. It is sad to see that the, you know that, that that there can't just simply be a distinction between a corporate culture and an academic culture. Mm -hmm. That they can't operate in different ways. That they couldn't even critique or learn from each other. Um, that there's a kind of infantilizing of of academic culture by this management culture. Anyone else have a question? No? Oh, I missed that. Thank you. Oh, Doug. Hi. Thank you. Um, you spoke of medium design as um, you gave the analogy of toggles, togglers and faders. I think it was. How many of these mixing boards would there be? And would you give these over? into like a grassroots movement, or how many of these togglers would there be? Who would be toggling? To yes, who would be toggling? Yeah. Yes. yeah. Um, well, it, I mean, it's a, there, I think there's no way to, you know, answer that question. I mean, I, I uh, n n no, I mean, it, it's a n no specific amount, I mean, I, other than to say that, um, and, uh, you know, I mean, I'm I'm trying to work within a design discipline to rehearse what that might mean, and uh, working in you know design studios and looking at what working that way what happens. Um, and um, you know, if you were to stand back and look at the wall at a final review or something like that, you'd see, you would see, what you would see is that kind of backing up into a macro organizational strata ends up, um, pro ends up with a lot of architectural precipitates, um, a lot of even conventional, like stuff with shapes and outlines, and I mean, the, the wall is filled with stuff that looks like architecture. Uh, and uh, uh, ha uh, it might be sites that are slightly different. Uh, the site might be a detail that one sees as a multiplier or, or something like that. Um, but there, there, it, it, what, what I guess I'm saying is that we, once we have started working in this way, there's kind of like a lot more to do just a lot more to do and a way also of seeing around a conventional uh, kind of fee-for-service practice. It, there's so much to do um, and so many reasons why a designer could be involved. Um. I maybe have... Um, uh, one last question for me, which is not to say other people can't ask other questions. Um, uh, and I don't know how much you can say about this, but, but since you um, tempted us with your upcoming Venice um, installation for the, for the Biennale, uh, wondering if um, you could talk a bit about how the project is going to be translated into the exhibition context and also um, it, when you were discussing that, you made a provocative remark about about these projects leaving the gallery. So, just wondering if we could um, get a little bit of more of a preview of what you're doing. Yeah. Yeah. I, well, I, I I said something about it today. I suppose because yeah. in a way, I really need a critique. Uh, <laughs> I need a I need some I need to yeah I need a critique. Uh, but the um, 
the intention is that uh, you're previewing a platform that is really, I mean, it is really being developed mm -hmm. um, through a consortium of players at Yale. We'll see like how far that goes. Mm -hmm. Obviously, it, it, I think it's a good project for students to rehearse with because there's a lot of students both in um, race, ethnicity, and migration and other programs and mm -hmm. uh, um, at Yale and as well as computer science and other things who are already kind of, um, I mean, it's a tiny little cohort, of about a half dozen people, but um, we, we are trying to expand that as something so that this platform can be something that students uh, cut their teeth on to work on figuring out, okay, what would it take, mm -hmm. you know, to do something like this? Um, and then, of course, it would have to leave Yale um, as well. Um, but the, the, the so, so at the Biennale, you're only seeing kind of a set of 100 examples, and mm -hmm. you can, so you can see then X numbers of, uh, combinations and so on, um, and you see a, you see a video which sort of shows some of that. It's meant to just show uh, from our research, even even if you look at something like the J-1 visa here in the United States, there are you know almost 4,000 J-1 visa sponsors mm -hmm. with all of their partners, and so you start to see. A lot of multipliers, and if you add these spatial variables and problems and failures to it, then it then it starts getting it starts to be even more. So what we want to show is just the the the, the immense potential for this kind of trading um, and matching uh, that, and try to also show. Uh, what kinds of legal ingenuity we might be working on instead of a lot of legal ingenuity to keep people out. There's a lot of effort there. Um, but uh, So it's trying to suggest a lot of things like that with the video and so on. But by getting out, it's, uh, it's that gesture. Mm -hmm. That gesture is a gesture that we want to, to leave the gallery um, to be found elsewhere. Mm -hmm. Um, and that that's I'm not I haven't done as much as I wanted to do with that um, because you know that that's the most interesting thing the, the, the Biennale that it has these silly national pavilions you know and when and when you know the Swiss pavilion wanted to 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 store some chairs and the Spanish pavilion it was like a national <laughs> diplomatic incident or something like mm -hmm. that so we, we were wanting to do more in, in kind of infecting mm -hmm. of other places we'll probably have to settle for uh, the making contagious a certain kind of gesture. There's some stamping that will happen also. Um, but, uh, it's very funny. But it is supposed to be like hobo code. Like that there's, there's marks that people leave mm -hmm. for each other. This is, a, this is not the nation's business. This is between yeah. us, okay. um, between persistent resourceful people. Um, yeah. More, yeah. Uh, so, I have a question about this idea of switching, and I know kind of epistemological terms are shifting in the way you're talking about them, so my question might be outmoded in a sense, but what is the kind of distant horizon of the kind of strategies of resistance and kind of tactics of switching that you've kind of presented tonight? Is there, do you merely see them as a way of kind of rewiring or patching up the systems already in place or do you actually see a possibility of them beginning to break parts of the system that we become so accustomed to without knowing or if there's any kind of moment where that begins to chip away once it becomes less opaque or where do you exactly situate your work given the fact that you're kind of rejecting the category of an ultimate end goal well, the, the way the way you were just talking about it, um, you know, <laughs> makes sense to me. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you were just you were just talking about uh, p potential for a s uh, a switch to you know break binaries or to add more information to a system or to make a system more information rich. I mean, it's it's all it's pretty. 
I mean, the kinds of things I'm talking about are really elementary, you know, on some level. And uh, um, yeah, it, 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 the intention is to is to add more is to add more information um, and uh, to uh, break down concentrations of of but power. Do you see a moment where there will be no more information to add anymore? Like what would happen mm -hmm. after? Well, I don't. I, I. I mean, as as you probably can tell, I don't really think in terms of ultimates. Um, you know, or 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 I'm suggesting that we have a tendency to think that that way to look for ult sort of the ultimate. You know, like apocalyptic moment of the end of all and and so on. But uh, but but I'm wondering, like, if we were thinking on the flip side of that, what would that be like? You know, where where you're not finished. There is no ultimate. You just keep you keep playing, you know, um, and you keep reacting to the this the situation until the cheaters kind of cheat you back, and then you figure out uh, what to do next. Because they they will. You know, like, <laughs> Okay, so should we wrap up? Yeah, um, so thank you again, Keller, for a fantastic presentation, and thank you everybody for coming. And, um. <laughs>